Hello there, I'm Gloria Makarenko. Now, even in challenging times, people keep finding ways to bring joy to others' lives. Well, let's find out how. This is Our Vancouver. Coming up, the owner of Charcuterie Vancouver has won this year's Small Business BC Award for Best Immigrant Entrepreneur. We're going to get a taste of what she's serving up. Dining on dim sum in a parking lot. Let's see how a Chinese restaurant is bringing friends together in a safe and savory new way. But first, sweet sounds to encourage people to get the COVID vaccine. Now, one of the things many of us have been missing during the pandemic has been live music. Well, if you get your COVID vaccine just at the right time in Powell River, you may hear our next guest playing his cello. That's right, and Arthur Arnold is not just a cellist, he is the conductor and artistic director of the Prisma Festival and Academy in Powell River. And right now we have reached him at the clinic. Arthur, hello there. Hello, Gloria. Hi. What a wonderful idea. And I can see people lining up for the vaccine but behind you there. How did this all come to be? How did you get to play the cello at the local vaccine clinic? Yeah, you know, I had a thought. Uh, well, first of all, it's Prisma, Prisma Festival. One of our board members is the, the head of, of VCH, Vancouver Coastal Health, Powell River. So I had some more insights and, and there was a, a need for volunteers. So first of all, I started to volunteer here. And then I thought, you know, all these people here lining up, why don't we give them some music? I started outside and, um, you know, before the clinic opened, but it was a bit cold still. So then I moved inside and I come here every day when the clinic is open. Oh, it, that, is, that is lovely. Now you've got your cello there. Can, can we just get a little bit of a sample of, of what people can yeah, expect so, to hear? Yeah, you know, I would, I would play some Bach, uh, for example, the, the, the first suite. Everybody knows that, right? Oh my or the, goodness, or, that or is already lovely. Suite. Same composer. It's very different. And then I will explain to them the differences about uh, within, within these pieces and maybe play something else or, you know. So it's a little bit of a music education along the way. Uh, well, you know, the most important I think is that, that we have been deprived of, of music for for a long time. Well, not musicians in their own homes, but as an audience, there there has not been no live music. And at the same time, people are here with different feelings and emotions, right? Some people are scared to get a needle in their arm. Other people might not be certain if they, this is the right choice. Uh, some people are so happy and so happy to finally see the beginning of the end of this pandemic so there are so many different emotions i've seen people with tears in their eyes when they got the jab it meant so much to them so um i think music brings all these emotions together and music is such a, a connector you know it connects us i mean look at your reaction just a minute ago um Music is some, some, some magical thing of waves in the air that, that brings us something. We understand the language of music, whether we are trained in it or not. So I think, I hope through the music, and not only at the clinic, but in my life as a musician, to connect people, to give people something, and to add something to our beautiful lives on this planet. Well, it is. It's a beautiful outlook, and it's quite a gift that you have to share as well. What kind of reaction do you get from people specifically at the clinic, clinic, especially since you point out some of them are feeling emotional just entering the building? Yeah, so I hear, for example, wow, I, I was not looking forward to the needle, and I just heard the music of Bach in the background, and it calmed me so much down. I wasn't afraid anymore. Or I heard things like, uh, thank you so much. This was just such a wonderful surprise to hear this beautiful music. Or things like, um, I mean, people who stay not for the required 15 minutes, but for an hour. And, and then we have to kick them out, really, because <laughs> we, need, we need the chairs for other people, right? 
<laughs> I can understand so, why. <laughs> yeah, so th those are the reactions, I guess, that, that come in all kinds of forms. And, and oh, thank wow. yous and Well, it's, it's lovely that you can bring your instrument and, and just offer up those, uh, you know, uh, concerts just on the fly like that but what about your summer music festival this the uh, prisma stands for pacific region international summer summer music academy how has your festival and your academy been affected by the pandemic you know there's been really low numbers in powell river because of its isolation and we felt it was not responsible to bring people to this community so we we swiveled again and are now teaching our academy online, but we'll get a few guest artists that will play on this very stage where I'm sitting now. We are actually sitting in the concert hall where Prisma takes place. That's the clinic in the concert hall here. And we will get the Lafayette String Quartet play a concert here in person that we will live stream. That sounds lovely. I hope you have a wonderful summer. Arthur, it has been such a pleasure to speak with you. I'm going to ask you a favor. Can you can you play us out with some more of your music, please? I, I will play you out. I, I happily do that. And I want to add a little little story to what I'm going to play for you, if that's okay. Please do. We, we have been playing in the school district for, for many of the schools here, Prisma for Kids. And one such school had their outside classroom in the forest. And we were all sitting on stumps far away from each other and I talked to them about Bach and how he wrote the cello suite 300 years ago and how Pablo Casals, the cellist, rediscovered this suite as a 13 year old boy in Spain. He started to practice them and when he was 60 he felt he was advanced enough to record them only when he was 60 years old. Now this same Casals wrote a piece, The Song of the Birds. And I'm going to play for you the song of the birds. But the magic happened there in the forest when all these kids were listening and so quiet. And the birds, honestly, the birds started singing during the piece that I will play now for you. Hello, my name is Eugene, and here is our Vancouver. Now, pandemic restrictions for indoor dining means makeshift patios are popping up all over the place. And while the concept of outdoor dining is not unusual, for Chinese restaurants in Canada, it is. Well, video producer Kevin Lee stopped by some local restaurants to chat with outdoor dim sum diners. Those who enjoy dim sum are trying something new. This is the first time we have dim sum outside. Yes, me too. I like it. Much better than inside, to me. We have no choice because of the COVID-19, right? So we can dine in in the, in the dining room, right? So that's why we, we, we have to put it in the patio. While it's common to see outdoor dining for Western establishments, it's a relatively new concept for Chinese restaurants in Canada. Sitting inside is better, of course. It's, uh, all, you can sit there all weather. Another pond is a really good pond, the Lois. It's been for more than 40 days. I haven't got this thing some already. I don't like to take home and eat it, so I just want to sit down with them. Yeah. You know, no dim sum for a long time. I think it's about a year or more than years. And then I do like to try. Yeah, I like dim sum. The culinary tradition of dim sum dates back over a millennia. It's popular in southern China and in Hong Kong. Dim sum is made up of a selection of freshly steamed tapas-styled dishes served alongside your favorite pot of tea during lunch. If for the family, that is the chance to get um, the gathering together. And then if for the fan night like today, I'm with my two girlfriends. We haven't seen each other for a year because of doing the COVID-19. So we would like to spend time properly an hour here to see each other. It's too soon to say if dim sum on the patio will continue once the pandemic restrictions are lifted. I like it so much, right? So all depends on the owner. Yeah, 
uh, and, uh, and the city as well, right? One thing is for certain, diners are just happy to enjoy dim sum, even if it's on the sidewalk. Kevin Lee, CBC News, Vancouver. Time for one of our favorite features. This is where we get to showcase a number of the photographs that are sent in by you, our audience. We'll start with this one. Lance Davies sent us this lovely landscape. It's looking west to Kamloops from Shoe Swap Road just before the Lafarge plant. That is so cool. Well, Karen Nelson took this photo on the weekend. It's East Sector Lands Park in Harrison Hot Springs. Karen, thank you so much for sharing that. Lovely. And finally, Trisha Thorpe captured this striking image of Kamloops Lake on a ridge above Copper Creek. Isn't that just lovely? And just send us more. It's easy. Just email your photographs to us, bcphotos at cbc.ca. Got it? bcphotos at cbc.ca. Now, the CBC has been celebrating the season with its Hello Spring campaign and featuring scenes of spring from across the country. So here's one from our own backyard, the Gary Oak Ecosystems in the Salish Sea. most common pesticides may be harming migrating monarch butterflies. Johanna Wagstaff will join us. She'll tell us more about this latest research. The answer to the great monarch butterfly decline may lie in a farmer's field in Halton, Ontario. A two-year experiment involving a real-world laboratory found that the chemicals of what are most common pesticides seem to reduce the number of eggs that successfully hatch. The multi-university research team, including University of Guelph scientists, worked with a farmer to plant one half of a small crop with corn seed and the other half with corn that had been coated with a common neonic. This is a basic pesticide used around the world to keep harmful insects away. And milkweed was deliberately planted along with the corn to attract the monarchs. Take a look at the results. The orange is the pesticide eggs, and you can see, compared to the control, about 3% less survived. Doesn't sound like much, but when we're talking millions of monarchs, that's pretty significant. 
This kind of pesticide, neonic, means neurotoxic. They permanently bind to insects' nerve cells, overstimulating and destroying them, and they're widely applied to common crops. In 2018, Health Canada proposed to tightly restrict the use of neonics, including a ban on all outdoor applications. It has since decided against the ban, but has added new rules to protect bees and marine life. Take a listen to one of the authors I spoke to about what he's hoping this study will provide decision makers. We have to understand that there's a trade-off between using these agricultural techniques and how it influences monarch butterflies. So it presents us with a choice, uh, really, about the area that we might use for genetically modified crops versus uh, conventional crops. And ultimately, this is what we need uh, for governments to make decisions about how to conserve monarchs and how to ensure that we have uh, functioning agricultural systems uh, to provide the food that we need to eat. We're talking a massive decline in these butterflies, and pesticides seem to be a part of the problem, along with changes to habitat and climate change. Often, when people think about the monarch, they think about butterflies. Monarchs serve as a really important role, a connection for people to butterflies and to nature. And now, you're science smart. If you have a science question on your mind, send me a tweet, and I'll try to get it answered. Thank you so much, Johanna. You are watching Our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. Now, if you are a small business owner who's still getting by, well, you deserve an award. But our next guest got a Small Business BC Award for Best Immigrant Entrepreneur. Sadaf Rahimi is the owner of Charcuterie Vancouver. Sadaf, hello there and congratulations. Hi, thank you so much. So nice to be here. Now, we talk about businesses getting by in tough times. How, how is your business doing these days? It's actually quite, it's doing well, thankfully, but it's definitely been a struggle this entire year. We've definitely had to pivot many times over the last few months. Okay, pivot from where then? In the before times, you used to cater big events, right? So how did you have to adapt? Yes, so before we had to cater weddings, anniversaries, baby showers and things like that, even corporate luncheons and parties. And obviously we were fully shut down for a few months at the beginning of the pandemic. And then we decided to make uh, to go charcuterie boxes. So we made little tiny individual ones and now everyone all over BC orders them for their virtual events. Okay, well, we're going to get you to put one of those together for us for, for the camera. But I just want to find out a little bit more about this award. Best Immigrant Entrepreneur. How do you think being an immigrant may have affected your experience uh, as a business person? I think being an immigrant uh, here in Canada, it's, de it's definitely hard because our family comes here from, you know, a third world, world country and we have to start completely from scratch. But at the same time, you kind of see the struggles that your parents go through and you want to make sure that your kids don't go through that. So you work even harder to... Um, build a better life for yourself. Nice. What was the reaction from your family when they found out you got this recognition? They were definitely shocked. Unfortunately, I had to sit here by myself at home and watch it. So my mom called me right away. and She was screaming about uh, the whole award. She couldn't believe it. It's definitely <laughs> a really exciting moment for our entire family. Uh, I must be so proud of you. Okay, well, let's get to the product and the charcuterie, shall we? And yes. thank you so much for working with us. I know you're doing your own, your own camera work there and everything, but uh, <laughs> why don't you just take us through what goes into preparing some of these spreads? Absolutely. So I'm in my little apartment right now by myself. So I'm going to show you guys kind of the steps of building our mini individual charcuterie boxes that everyone's been ordering for their virtual events this year. So I'm just going to tilt the camera here in a second, just like that. I have that for you. So the base here, what I have is some crackers, we have dip, um, and we have three types of cheeses. I have brie, manchego, and an aged cheddar. Um, and then I have some of the other ingredients on the side here. And I'm just gonna put a glove on because I don't like touching this stuff even at home. <laughs> and I'll show you how we kind of build it and put it together. Oh, so you look so the cheese... organized there too. Okay, so what? Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll let you take it away. <laughs> yes. So um, what I have in front of me uh, uh, is some meat. We have olives. I'm just going to show you a little pan. Oh, that looks That's lovely. Kind of so looks I would like... I'd take that tray too. <laughs> <laughs> sure, you can come grab this once we're done here. Um, so the cheeses go in first, and then what I'm going to do is uh, throw in some of the fruit. So I have blueberries which go very well on a charcuterie board. And I'm just gonna throw that right 
in the middle center of the board. A little splash of I color will, there, and you don't have to worry about them getting it, squished in the meantime. Exactly. So always recommend having different colors of fruit. It really makes your boards pop. So I have some blueberries in there. And then right above the blueberries, I'm going to throw in some cut strawberries. Mm. So I've cut those already. Put a few in there. Oops, I'm not going to use that. Again, not too juicy, so it's not going to run over everything else. It stays, but it is, again, that pop of color. It looks great. That's right, yes. So really beautiful colors here, fresh fruit. Um, and then on this little corner right here, I'm going to throw in some olives. We always want to have some olives in our charcuterie boards, and the green also gives it a really nice contrast. So you never want to kind of put two colors that are the same beside each other. Oh, okay. So, there are some rules. Okay, I'll pay attention. Mm -hmm. I guess my rules. <laughs> it just it helps the board just look, you know, more contrasted and more beautiful. And then I have some mini little pickles that I add in there. Gives it a really nice savory test. Hey, wait! You put a green pickle next to a green olive. Can you? That's two colors next to each other. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you you can, those are kind of the same thing. It's the same taste. You don't okay. really want to mix that with with anything else there. Okay. Um, so what I've created before on here is a little salami rose. Oh, Can you see that? yes, that's beautiful. See, that's, How long that's did that salami. take? I see. Well, that just takes a little oh. bit of patience to fold it out. I see. Oh, it takes about 20 seconds. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay. Super quick, super quick. We do, we have virtual classes on these as well. And I teach everyone how to make a salami rose and everyone kind of gets really excited about that. So we got our salami rose here. We have uh, spicy salami and peppered salami. And then if you want to add regulars, you can do that as well. So this is where I should be changing my gloves, but we're just going to continue here for the sake of the video. Um, I have some chocolate here uh, just to add a nice little sweet taste to our boards, kind of a dessert all in one all at the end when you're lovely, done. Lovely, lovely. So you've got it all there. <laughs> so ultimately you would take a cracker or a piece of bread. Mm -hmm. You could have some bread on the side, I suppose. And then what's that dip, yes. the dip that you have there? That This one here is a spinach dip, mm -hmm. uh, but typically we either include artichoke dip or a spinach dip. It just really depends on the day. <laughs> oh, there's so lots of lovely bites and flavors in there. And I like how you've left a little, bit of, a little bit of chocolate and different textures too. So yes. what are you adding there? Does that uh, hazelnuts or some so kind of nuts? This is uh, oh, pistachios, pistachios that I'm adding in. Mm. Yes, mm. really good idea to have some nuts on your boards you kind of want to have a variety of everything so charcuterie is turned into kind of like a grazing grazing board you have a little bit of everything in there but you've yeah. made a very good point in times of covid this is oh Oops. that's okay it's nice it looks good on the, it looks good in the picture there actually it, it works well it works well um so yes. I, again this would be for one person you just take your own you don't have to worry about dipping double dipping sharing mm. all this kind of thing which exactly. also works well in in times of COVID and when we're yes. all trying to just say, stay safely distanced. Well, it mm -hmm. looks like you're really mm -hmm. onto something. Thank you very much for putting together that of little course. gem for us today and really lovely to meet you. I hope you have a great summer. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Um, I guess I'm gonna go enjoy this for myself now. Thank you. Hi, my name is Katra. Her name is Aza. This is our anchor. Now, a lot of big events have been cancelled or gone online since the pandemic hit. Usually set in Victoria, the Short Circuit Pacific Rim Film Festival has taken their program of short, local and international films online this year for the month of May. So you still have time to check it out. For more information, go to shortcircuitfilmfestival.com. <laughs> Marissa Wong and Katie Cassidy of Two Big Steps present a double bill of new works at the Dance Center. They're going to be live streaming three times, once Friday, May 28th, and twice on Saturday, May 29th. If you'd like more information, just go to thedancecenter.ca. Hey, Grant Lawrence from CBC Music here, and if you're feeling a little pent up, and isolated, like so many of us are right now, sometimes you just need a release. And in my opinion, one of the most tried and true stress relievers is the healing power of loud and proud 
rock and roll music. So if you need to pump up the volume and raise your fist and shake your hips, then wow, do I have the perfect band for you after spending more than a year behind a mask. They're called Pale Lips. Recalling the best of the Runaways, the Riff Randalls, and the Donnas, that is Pale Lips, a band made up of four rock and roll loving women based in Montreal that have been puckering up and putting out great explosive rock and roll songs for years, like this one. I may have pulled something dead through that one, but I'm feeling better already overall. That is Montreal band Pale Lips with Don't Take Your Switchblade to New York. And did that video remind you of anything? Yes, punk rock trivia fans, that is a takeoff on the classic Ramones video, I Wanna Be Sedated. See, like the Ramones, one of the greatest aspects of Pale Lips is that they managed to capture several different eras of rock and roll in their sound, from 50s doo-wop to 60s garage, 70s punk, and 90s indie rock, into what Pale Lips describes as drippy, mascara-slopped rock and roll with sprinkles. Here's Pale Lips with You're a Doll. From their most recent album, After Dark, which is about to be re-released on Rumbar Records out of Boston, that is Pale Lips. They're from Montreal, though the members of the band call places like Regina, Ottawa, and Windsor as their hometowns. You're a Doll by Pale Lips is a song that you need to add to your stress reliever playlist for this week. I'm Grant Lawrence from CBC Music. Stay safe, crank it up, keep your lips pale behind your mask, and I'll check in with you again next week. Coming up, why three Vancouver students are campaigning to rename their elementary school after a trailblazing runner. Hello and welcome back to our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. Now, students at an East Vancouver school have started a campaign to change the name of their school from Lord Strathcona Elementary to Barbara Howard Elementary. Karen Larson has more on that story. They love their school, but students from Lord Strathcona Elementary don't love the man it was named for. He was an inspirational. He wasn't, he was kind of just, Basic. Lord Strathcona, you see, was a European colonialist who worked for the Hudson's Bay Company. In 1885, he was granted the honor of driving in the last spike of the Canadian Pacific Railway by virtue of being cousins with the railroad's president. He then got a lot of things named after him, like Lord Strathcona School. But a hundred plus years later, students feel it's time for a change, especially after learning the almost forgotten story of this woman, 
pioneering track star and former Lord Strathcona teacher Barbara Howard. It was a big shocker because you know they didn't I hadn't learned about her uh, from anywhere before and it was just very new and different. Howard grew up in East Vancouver. As a teen in the late 1930s, she became the first black woman to represent Canada internationally, setting an unofficial world record in the 100-yard dash. I can't really think of myself at the age of 17 doing that much, as much as she did, and I just think that's really cool. When the Second World War derailed Howard's running career, she went to UBC and became the first teacher of color hired by the Vancouver School Board. The students say renaming their school Barbara Howard Elementary would be a most deserving tribute for the woman who passed away in 2017 at age 96. Recognition of a trailblazer who was also one of their own. As an athlete myself, you know, she encouraged me to work harder and just pursue my goals. I think that because our community is so diverse that uh, she would be a much better representation. The students will be making their plea to the school's Parent Advisory Council on May 19th and are hoping for a meeting with the Vancouver School Board. Karen Larson, CBC News, Vancouver. Now how does someone decide to quit their job and try to become a full-time professional social media influencer? Well, 24-year-old Austin Fritsch of Kelowna gave herself 30 days to do just that. And her older sister, Shailen Fritsch, wrote and directed this documentary about it for the CBC Creator Network. Action. Hi, I'm Austin. I'm 24, and in 30 days, I'm going to be quitting my full-time job. I always work so many different jobs, most of them being in sales with targets and bosses and corporate where I wasn't performing the way that they wanted me to be performing, but I always knew that I had what was best for the customer at heart, but I just couldn't quite get over that trying to sell somebody something that they don't actually need. I love creating content more and I just wanted to push through and give myself what I needed, which is more time to be creative. One week next Wednesday that I'm handing in my notice to quit my job and I am so excited. Um, I'm obviously a little bit scared. It's kind of a scary thing to do. So I have so many ideas. I actually have them all written down in my notebook here. I made a huge list of these 44 different brands. Hey! And it is my goal to try to email them all by the end of the week. And so far I got one response that they are only interested in a gifting. They're gonna send me five products and offer me commission if I make any sales with them. Leo, please. Leo is literally sabotaging this entire operation. Look what he did. As more followers came, more demand from brands came where I kind of saw an opportunity that, hey, this is the point where I can start to charge. I've had enough experience doing this. Brands are willing to pay for what I'm doing starting to see that other girls were making it a full-time career and working for themselves just really you know inspired me to want to do the same i have so many things that i want to do i get so excited when i get new clothing like it just makes me want to shoot again so i better get to it i could only decide on one outfit so i'm going to shoot in that it is one of the tops that i was just sent so i do need to post in it for a gifted collaboration and i like to shoot in indirect sunlight i'll show you so the sun is obviously right there and then i will be shooting um right over there so it should be just bright enough just on the phone with dad and it's really making me miss shooting content with him because he shot all of my content for years and I had to just adjust to using the tripod and doing it myself now. 
The time to quit just felt really right right now. I've been working really hard the last two years. We're really lucky with having low rent that we pay. Everything at the bare minimum, I think it's ever gonna cost me for cost of living. Whereas if I waited too long, taking the leap would seem like a way bigger gap and maybe I'd be too scared to do it. I'm just going to pose. I'm gonna do this photo next. I'm still on the clock. It's 8.02, but I need to get a photo up. So I'm just gonna do it now really quickly. Literally like hours away from handing in my notice of resignation and things are just going so incredibly well today. I just got a message from one of my followers and she says, girl, I just wanted to say you are absolutely killing it. You are genuinely one of my favorite people to follow and I look forward to and love each and every one of your posts. I saw on TikTok that you're starting content creation full time soon and I just wanted to wish you luck and success. You are going to do amazing and everyone will know your name soon enough. You inspire me and so many other girls more than you know. And my heart is absolutely melting. Like, I am getting like so emotional <laughs> with all my support and today is like a big day obviously, like 30 days ago today. I said, in 30 days, I'm going to quit my job. So it's all happening and it's all happening with an abundance of support and love and community. I just know in my heart that this is the right thing to do. Coming up, how tighter COVID restrictions in the Maritimes have trapped some BC families who have been planning to move out east. Hi, welcome back to our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. Well, the pandemic has hit and nearly missed the provinces in vastly different ways. The Maritimes shut down, forming kind of a, a regional bubble that largely worked at keeping out the virus. But when their cases rose, they closed in more tightly. And as Megan Stewart reports, those strict measures have trapped some BC families looking to head east. A Victoria couple plan to call this trailer home for a few months as they cross the country to a new property in Nova Scotia. We would always plan to move back to the Maritimes. Um, we probably would have moved to Newfoundland except for the ferry. It's been 30 years in the making, but for the moment, Julia and her husband Robert have to park their dreams and embrace more of the van life than they'd bargained for. I think we've spent, oh my goodness, over $2,000 to stay in the trailer park so far. And we, we budgeted for that, but we didn't budget to stay in for another month, two, three, you know. We didn't budget for, you know, having to spend, you know, an indefinite period of time in our trailer. So far, they haven't left Victoria. The message from Nova Scotia, don't come. Not yet. Strict border control uh, is an imperative uh, piece to make sure that we're not uh, bringing in any more uh, cases while we're trying to control the cases that we have now. The province will consider exceptions for people closing on a home sale by May 20th. In Julia and Robert's case, their closing date is May 31st. Messaging has been inconsistent, but the province's top doctor clarified Friday, asking people to apply for those exemptions closer to the date they plan to arrive in their new province. We're asking people to hold off uh, and we'll make some decisions and make it clear to people who with those later uh, closing dates as we get closer to the end of May. A week earlier, another BC family was making haste across the prairies. After selling their home near Souk, the Dillons had been enjoying a leisurely trip from the Pacific coast to the Atlantic. We had a call from her realtor and she says uh, that Nova Scotia is shutting down. With that new deadline, and fearing they'd be stranded at the border, they hit the Trans-Canada, aiming to drive nearly 4,000 kilometers in three days. A snag getting into the Atlantic bubble left them in Quebec, along with other travelers and truckers. They ran out of propane, but they got the word they'd been waiting for. Their application to enter the Maritimes on compassionate grounds was approved. 
we just want a safe passage home to Nova Scotia. Late Friday night, at last, they arrived at their Oceanside property, a view of Newfoundland across the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Meantime, in Victoria, Julia and Robert are preparing for their own trip back east. They'll ask for compassion too, and will camp until they can get home. Megan Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. Whether it's Greta Thunberg or the sustainabilities, many of the world's most passionate environmentalists are also the youngest. In 2002, children from 60 different countries came to BC for an environmental meeting. And Eve Savory brought us that story. They came from 60 different countries. They speak 36 different languages. What they share is a commitment to the environment and a determination to get the world's political leaders on board. We need to challenge world leaders to focus on our environment today so that our, our world will be a healthy place when we become the world leaders of tomorrow. Every one of these children has shown environmental leadership in their community or school. Now they're teaching each other. As fast as you can snap your fingers, people are dying because they don't have clean water. And they're learning about problems in other countries. I live in Bogota, Colombia. For the Canadians, it's an eye-opener. I learned that, well, environment's last on their list because they're worrying about, what am I going to eat tomorrow? The theme this day is water. The idea is they will go home and change things. Where I live, there's lots of pollution, and I have to go back after this conference and tell them about it. But this isn't just about kids. Three months from now in Johannesburg, world leaders will meet to discuss progress in the 10 years since the Earth Summit in Rio. If they're going to do something, now's the time. Like, it can't be done in 20 years. The children are demanding a say. Because it's our future, we're going to live it, not the adults. So along with the lessons and the play, the kids are drawing up what they call challenges to present to the leaders. But children have gone to other environmental conferences. All the ministers there said, wonderful, because I was one of the children who presented the statement to be told us, what a good job, wonderful, you know. We promised we're going to go back and do something, and nothing was done. 13-year-old Yvonne Mainge stands out even in such outstanding company. In Kenya, she has her own TV show. What would she say to the world's leaders? Keep your promises, you know. And now the UN has told them they're going to get a chance to say it in person. It will send two of them to Johannesburg to talk to the world's leaders. The kids, well, they're a little reluctant. How many of them want to go? Everybody. They'll learn tomorrow who goes, and they're confident this time they'll be heard. It's just the fact that we have our own conference on the environment and it's us talking. That just shows in its own that people are beginning to listen to us. The UN can give the children a forum, but it can't force the world's prime ministers and presidents to act. Perhaps that's up to the adults. Eve Savory, CBC News, Victoria. CBC Vancouver is so lucky to have award-winning photographer Ben Nelms on staff. Here are a few images of the week we had, captured in only the way Ben can. And that's all for our Vancouver for this week. I hope you can join me weekday afternoons on CBC Radio 1 for On the Coast. For now, goodbye.